pretty well. Mama was a crackhead, Papa was a rolling stone. Got more brothers and sisters than the law allows. Seemed like every holiday I meet a new one. From the projects, the hood of Los Angeles, California. And folk always said I would never be nothing, never amount to anything. Said I'd never get out of the hood, that I'd be a statistic all my life. But I messed around and found out that the hand of God was on my life. And when the hand of God is on your life, no matter where you come from, you will find out where you're going. It's not that I've arrived, I'm just simply emerging. Well, I'm extremely excited because for the first time ever, we've got Project Emerge Live, and we are right here in Detroit, Michigan. First of all, let me thank Kevin Adele. Let me thank my boy Dave Sheffield for this incredible opportunity. Uh, several months ago, Bishop Greg Davis brought a couple of dozen individuals from across the country into this very studio. And that conversation created a, an ignition across the country of conversations. And so tonight, we've got some of the emerging voices of the largest African-American Pentecostal denomination in the world, the Church of God in Christ. I'm extremely excited because in this room, not only do we have preachers, pastors, superintendents, missionaries, but we've got rocket scientists, we've got mayors, we've got entrepreneurs, and we're gonna have a conversation that I promise you is gonna be life-changing. Whatever you're doing, call your mama, your daddy, your cousin, call somebody and tell them to tune in right now to the Word Network. I'm extremely excited. Right after this, we're going to get started with our panel. The dictionary defines a one-trick pony as a person or thing with only one special feature, talent, or area of expertise. But when I read the Bible in Genesis, the first chapter, around 26 verse, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. It says let us because God is multifaceted. And not only are we supposed to be multifaceted, but we're supposed to dominate. Every kingdom citizen not only should be multifaceted, but your assignment is to dominate every area God has gifted you to be in. So Project Emerge is not about emerging just in one place, but in every place. The soul of your feet shall tread. Dominate. Well, once again, we're back here at the Word Network, and I'm extremely excited because this generation is full of individuals who are multifaceted. This generation is full of people who don't just do one thing, but do several things and do them well. This panel, we've got individuals like Ulysses Henderson. Ulysses Henderson is a general counsel for the Church of God in Christ. He is a record label executive. He's a former rocket scientist at NASA. Wow. We've got people like Christopher Martin. Christopher Martin is pastoring a thriving church, one of the fastest growing churches in the city of Flint, Michigan, but he is also a former elected official in that city that managed multiple millions of dollars for the city. We've got a gentleman by the name of Alex Hope. Alex is the, for, the founder of the Renewal Conference. He's a business owner, a gospel artist, and a television producer. We've got John Christian, who is the mayor of Leesburg, Florida. He served as a commissioner for that city, and he's on his fourth term as mayor of that city. And they are all preachers. Wow. Now, brothers, just listening to that introduction makes me tired. How in the world, Pastor Henderson, uh, Elder Henderson, how do you manage being multifaceted? A lot of people are good at one thing, but they fail at others. How do you manage being, how do you manage maximizing every moment? That's actually a good question. It's, um, it's difficult because you only have so much time within a day. And so managing things on any given day, I, I'm a, a, a partner at a law firm. Uh, I also am over the, the legal counsel all the legal affairs for the Church of God in Christ. In addition to that, I'm also the chairman of the publishing house. Right. So there's many different assets and facets to what I do. In addition to that, I also work within the music industry. So I'm in and out of the office, um, sometimes within a recording studio. And, um, and then I also, I'm a husband and a father. Absolutely. And so having to go and take my son to soccer practice or basketball practice, and still the struggle of making time for the family. So. It's one of those things that God has just gifted me. I don't really think about it. I just do it. I don't, I don't think I do everything 
perfect. Sure. But um, just having the right balance, I think, is just the important thing and understanding what's first and first and first is foremost and also too, I'm a Sunday school teacher. Absolutely. So on Sunday morning, I teach a, a group of, of young adults, our, uh, our Get Fresh crew at West, An at West Angeles Church of God in Christ. So, you know, God has just gifted me to be able to navigate through different things and has just blessed me and given me wisdom on how to balance all this. I think that's incredible that you are literally the legal counsel for the Church of God in Christ, rocket scientists, and you teach Sunday school? Well, the thing that's actually interesting is that with my background, everything has worked together for ministry. So being a, uh, an engineer and a scientist, I'm taught to be diligent, taught to be very technical, right. uh, taught to analyze. You see a problem, and our job is, is to fix the problem and find a solution. As a lawyer, I advocate. Wow. So I have to take a, a legal proposition and argue before a judge. Wow. That is basically what we do as preachers of the gospel. It's apologetics. Wow. It's arguing the text, finding and speaking to a solution, what God's word has that fits every situation and every solution, that can provide a solution to every problem. So that's really how, you know, magically my background has fit together uh, for ministry. Now, Brother John, you are the mayor for the fourth term of your city. I remember, and I was raised by my grandma, I remember a time when the saints of old would preach and teach against the saints in politics. Ain't no man of God got no business in politics and all that kind of stuff. Do you still feel the need to fight against those ideologies or, or have we come a long way in that area? I think when we uh, start our, our mission as a pastor or a community leader, I think uh, the body of Christ must realize, and, and we started our church in 2000, um, I did my community work in 1997 in the program Bishop Kenzie had started in Church of God in Christ, Men of Distinction. Wow. Um, our, our goals was to get African-American men um, more involved in their community and re-engage in their family, those who come out of prison. So for me, being in the city where I'm raised, where I was born, um, to, to rise to that level, you know, as a church, you know, I wanted a gymnasium for, for our young people. I wanted affordable housing. Our church couldn't afford to do that. So uh, the political side for me is easy because I think when you're passionate about your city, passionate about your community, we preach it every Sunday preach about cleaning our community up, preach about getting um, young black men um, back involved, but we do it in the four walls of our church. Uh, for me, it's more of uh, politically, I can now, uh, $158 million budget. Uh, we're talking about a $3 million gymnasium that, that we built after 15 years of us wow. talking about in the community, a $2 million community resource center where our people are now able to go and get job skills. So a lot of times I think the church limits ourselves because I think we think people want us to be hoopologists, wow. and I think we have to evolve and realize that now the modern congregant wants more than just a preacher. They want someone who knows about mortgages, who knows about how to make changes happen. Um, as, as far as people call me and say, we need speed bumps in our neighborhoods. You know, one phone call makes that happen. So I think we preach it to a congregation, but we're not able to help them. And we started, it was more than just, I want to pray for you. My father's a pastor. I saw my father praying for people leaving out the church saying, okay, hope you get a job. But we, you know, we want to start, you know, child care centers. We want our city to be a partner. And as a pastor, we got to be careful that I'm, I'm a pastor, a man of God first, right. uh, a mayor second. So, wow. so my, my, my conversation has to always be mindful of I represent God first. Absolutely. Now, Pastor Martin, what responsibility, if any, does the black church have to our community? I think the black church has, uh, has to take a multifaceted approach for the community that we're in. As a former elected official, you serve a lot of people in the community, and if you can get legislation passed or get bills passed or things of that nature that affects people for the good, then you're okay. When those things don't happen, it's a problem. Wow. And they bring that mindset to the church. And as the mayor said, if people come to church and they are suffering financially, they are suffering with health care, they're suffering with employment opportunity. We got to do more than hoop. We got, we got to be able to provide some tools and some outlets. My church is in Flint, a church that, a, a church in a city that's battling a water crisis. Right. So before we could preach to people, we had to give out water. Wow. We had to do those types of things. We had to build a computer lab, which we have for the unemployment rate so people could come in and job search. We built a library inside of our church to close the literacy gap among uh, children of color versus children who are in affluent neighborhoods. So our churches really have to be open seven days a week right. to meet the mental stress 
that people bring in in the black community and other communities as well. Incredible. Now, Alex, you are in a different field in entertainment. How did you break out of that religious box that sometimes people want to put you in? Um, I think what happens is when you're multi-talented, um, it's easy for people to want to place you in a specific box. Um, but what I realized is that um, each talent that you have actually pushes you to the next season of your life. Right. Um, I think about David. David was multi-talented. He started as a shepherd um, on the backside of the mountain. As he was a shepherd, he was learning how to tend flock, but also how to handle people. From there, that pushed him to becoming a warrior because he had to fight the lion and the bear. And while he was a warrior, that brought him to his Goliath. Incredible. While still, he was a musician as well. And that kept him in the palace uh, when Saul needed his, his demons cast out. Um, what I realized is that every talent that you have is for your next season. It pushes wow. you to next seasons. And so you almost have to fight against um, the notion of having to be one. Wow. Uh, because I believe that God puts giftings inside of us for a reason. Now, how many people in this room, now these are all preachers in their own right, and for the sake of the show, we're not calling evangelists missionaries, we're all preachers. How many of y'all are multifaceted in that you're entrepreneurs, you do other things other than preach? Isn't it incredible? Now, do you all feel like the church still wants to hold you captive to just one thing, or do you all feel like we've gotten to the point where we're free to, be, to do other things? Anybody? You saying so-so? Talk to us. Well, um, again, I say so-so because, again, you still have the tradition that you want to hold to with the church and then, again, move with the, you know, modernizing things as well. But you want to also just be kind of mindful of the image that you want to show to the people. So I just say so-so, um, not necessarily in a way that it's not progressing, but just so that you, again, can be mindful of the image that you withhold as well. Wow, anybody else? Yes, sir. And I would say as a young preacher, people value your ministry more when you have a career, uh, when you're able to multifaceted and speak truth to power wow. in multi arenas. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited we're just getting started, but right now we are going to one of the most incredible groups in the world. The Church of God in Christ has a long legacy of Kojic, but yet anointed voices. And this group is no exception. Will y'all help me welcome to the stage Shelby Five. We are not ashamed. Thank you. 
so you know what favor feels like. Will you be listening? If you won't take a stand in here, you'll never go out there and take one. We do. That's Ah, declaring that holiness is right. But joy will come in the morning. Wow. Dear. Wow. These were some of the most iconic female voices in ministry that we've heard just this minute ago. And I'm extremely excited because I think we've got some of the greatest female voices of our current jurisdiction that are part of the Church of God in Christ on this panel. Would you please help me welcome Evangelist LaShawn Berry, <laughs> Dr. Lawana Grant, Evangelist Vandalin Kennedy, Evangelist Bridget Wright, and Evangelist Shariah Anderson. Now, ladies, you all just heard some of those icons of the woman, of the female voice for ministry. Have their struggles paved the way for you? Are, are your struggles the same as, her, as theirs, or do you all feel like y'all still struggling to survive? Luana. Absolutely. The struggles of the previous generation and what they have conquered has paved the way for us. You know, I always um, think about Moses had his own uh, set of things that he had to handle when Joshua had his um, struggles that he had to overcome. And so absolutely the generation gone, that has gone before us has paved the way for what we're walking in now. But it is our responsibility to overcome the struggles that we are encountering in this generation for the generation that's coming behind us. So indeed, they have overcome some things they have paved the way but there are still some things that our generation are conquering for the next generation to come behind talk to me about that vandalin i mean what what does that mean i mean is sexism still a real thing in the pulpit well it certainly is wow um it, it's ladies it's, okay it's a hard truth it really is and like dr grant said it's something that we've got to deal with we've got to speak truth to power um, because there are young ladies that are coming along behind us. And at the same time, we can't make that the focal point of our ministry. I have to focus on what the Lord has called me to do. Absolutely. And understand that God has a way. Right. Samuel, his environment was crazy. <laughs> he didn't know the voice of God. Right. But God found him where he was so that he could complete the assignment that God gave him. And so I think that there's a twofold focus on the assignment and yet speak truth to power. So after the, the type of women that we just heard on that clip, um, Sister Wright, do you feel like you still have to defend yourself as a preacher? Well, uh, I can con concur with Sister Vandal and what she just mentioned. Long as you really know who you are and your assignment and keep the assignment as the focal point, uh, you can really um, uh, counteract any uh, thing that would try to come against you. Long as I know who I really am and who God has called me to be, that maintaining my focus, therefore I'm able to withstand that they may try to come against. Awesome. Now, Shariah, you are one of the up and coming for your generation. You're traveling a lot now. I've been watching you on Facebook. <laughs> I'm very proud of what the Lord is doing in your ministry. What is that experience like for a young female who's traveling? What, what do you feel comfortable traveling alone? Do you have to have certain precautions and how do you feel received? Um, I think as a young woman in ministry, there definitely are a lot of barriers and precautions that you have to have simply because people may say that they come in the name of Jesus and that they love God. However, they have ulterior motives. So as a young woman, although um, ministry um, is in the forefront, I definitely, as a woman, always make sure that I set barriers so that when I minister um, and so that when I'm traveling, if I'm traveling alone or if I'm traveling with someone, that there's no room for anything to ever be said, Absolutely. that nobody can ever say that I was here or that I was having this conversation because if I do my work of ministry, and then keep it moving, then you can never say anything. Now, Sister Barry, you come from a preaching family. Um, I'm, I'm not going to call someone's name, but you got a brother that's one of the greatest preachers our church has ever produced. Do you feel like there's got to be, I don't want to use the word competition, but do you feel pressure to live up to a certain standard? Because I hear that women feel like they've got to work harder just to get the same result as a man. I, I would say the pressure is there to the extent for women 
Uh, you can almost compare it to racism. Wow. Where uh, black people, if you would, have to do it two times better wow. than our counterparts. And I think women feel the pressure to be prepared uh, to not just try to hoop our way out of something, but to hmm. live up to the call. Uh, a lot of my friends and my peers that are in ministry, they've uh, gone back to school, they've educated themselves in biblical studies, and I feel that along with the anointing and being prepared, uh, as Sister Bridget said, once you are prepared and you know who you are in God and you come forward, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. It's not a competition. I'm not in competition with men. I'm not in competition with my sister because we're all on the same team. Wow. Ladies, sexism, is it real in church? Talk to me. I'm sorry. The reality is this. Um, you can be anointed and be a woman. Wow. And do the work. But they would call a man before they called you. Not because you're not anointed. But because of some of the stuff that some women have done before us that have given us a bad name. Wow. Um, it's not that every woman is the same. But what happens is when one woman does something crazy, it puts us all in the same box. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to um, have the posture of, hey, I'm anointed and I know protocol. Sure. I know what to do. I don't have to sleep my way to the top. Wow. And so that's the thing that we deal with. Okay. Sister Kalisha, you are a new first lady, uh, but you have the benefit of having ministry-minded people, not just as your parents, but as your in-laws. Your mother-in-law is one of the greatest female preachers our church has. Do you feel like you're being mentored? Do you feel like the generation of the past has mentored and equipped you for this new role as a first lady? I believe so, yes. Um, and I guess I have been blessed by having people who um, are in my inner circle um, from the prior generation, including my mother, um, my mother-in-law, right. who have cultivated me and taught me and were transparent, and they actually show me the life. Wow. Not just saying, oh, yes, this is what I do um, for a ministry or as a career, but they show me. Wow. And I've pulled on that. Just over the years, that's what I pull on. Right. I pull on them. I pull on uh, their practical knowledge of ministry as well as the lifestyle. Because you can preach and teach all that you want. But if you don't live it and show me these women that are coming up behind us, Absolutely. we're producing seeds that can't uh, come to fruition. But it's like a dead seed. Wow. It'll never come up. Wow. So you have to live that life. And I've been blessed um, to actually transfer that over, I guess, to the ministry that I'm serving at now. Sister Ariel, let's, let's, let's jump into some deep waters because y'all playing a little safe. <laughs> y'all playing it real safe up in here. Separate but equal. Is not, now, this is a room full of Kojic people. And there's this notion that the Church of God in Christ doesn't support women in ministry. What do you say about that? Um, I mean, that statement, I have a testimony of both. Okay. Um, I don't feel that mentors always mentor the mentee or, are, there are not, or sometimes you don't, they're not as confident um, in their own ministries. And at times, if they're intimidated by you, um, they don't seem to push the emerger. Wow. Um, at times I feel that, or I believe um, that um, there are times where uh, as an even an emerging leader, an emerging young woman in ministry, um, it takes a special eye and a special anointing to discern the next generation's leaders. Wow. And I've been for a very long time praying in my private closet and, um, and have... I've been approached by um, women in ministry to see me, yes. Um, Dr. LaWanna Grant was one who pulled me where I was and asked me to serve on the Young Women of Excellence. But there are some instances where I felt left out. Um, I felt um, like I've fallen beneath the cracks. Um, and I also know that I'm called. Wow. So, um, no, I don't agree with... If a mentor sees their mentee, I think sometimes there is an intimidation there. 
um, that they, you might be you know, the next planet shaker and you know, you, let's just make sure she doesn't get the microphone. How many of you ladies feel mm -hmm. in, like people, are, men in particular, intimidated by you? Oh, y'all want to place? Thank you, Evangelist. Talk to us. There is a reality that there's an intimidation uh, because often men sometimes feel that women want to take their place. Wow. I can only speak for myself. I don't want a place that does not belong to me. Wow. And I don't want to be in a place of a man because God created me to be a woman. Amen. But in ministry and being in the ministry as long as I've been in, this is 32 years for me preaching the gospel. Wow. One of the greatest challenges is, is for us to have an honest heart to see others come in the place that God has brought them in without intimidation that they come in to take our place. Wow. And that's why when I think about women, when I, my 30 something years, I didn't have a mentor. Okay. I didn't have someone that mentored me in when I started going out ministering as an evangelist. And I think one of the things is, is that we must gather and look toward the generation that is up now and those that are coming behind us and not be intimidated that they're going to replace us. But when we are off the face of the earth, what kind of church do we have next? Wow. And those that are on the forefront cannot push those back that are not in the circle. Wow. Those that are not connected with certain ones wow. that put their name in the hat to give them an opportunity to come to the forefront. Wow. When God's favors with you, then he brings you to the forefront. Now, this time, we always already run out of time, so let's keep our responses uh, hot and, and fire. All right? Talk to me. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I definitely agree with Prophetess Whitelaw and what she was saying because um, something that we have to keep in mind is the fact that everybody doesn't come from a line of preachers. Wow. Like she said, everybody is not in the circle of the known, uh, the name that, you know, I praise God for those who are. But everybody is not cultivated in that same breed of people. And so we have to keep in mind, and especially nowadays because there's a false, there's a negative image um, uh, that is on strong women. Okay. So we see strong women and people always look at it as though it's a it's intimidating thing or it's a bad thing. But a woman can be strong and know her place. Wow. A woman can be strong and still be submissive, can be strong and still be meek. Hmm. And so understanding um, our places like they were saying, um, it's important for us to know our calling, know our assignment so that we can fulfill it effectively and efficiently. So talk to me, uh, Luana, about this balancing act, because I think you all. After you get through preaching, you got to go home, make sure the house is clean, dinner's cooked for your husband. If you got kids, make sure they straight. Talk to me about that. How hard is that? Absolutely. It's not hard when you have the grace of God on your life. Wow. And you understand that your first, first calling is your home. My first calling, um, after I've prayed and I've, 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 sought, I've, um, I've, I've, I've talked to God for what he wants me to do, I need to get up and I, mean, I need to minister to Dale Grant. That's my husband. Talk to him. Um, I need, when I'm on the road, I don't, <laughs> I don't overstay myself and I don't pre-stay. I'm not, I'm not going for a shopping trip. No, I'm going to do what I I have been called to do and I need you to get my flight home because my husband is waiting for me. There is a meal that's waiting to be prepared. There are Come clothes that's waiting to be washed. And when you know your place in the kingdom, you understand that being a wife, that's an anointing that you have. So that's a balancing act. And so again, that does come with the grace of God. When you are in ministry, when you're a wife, I don't have children. When you're a mother, you understand that you can't be um, in the streets and not taking care right. of your home. Now, Vandalin, and then I'm going to go to so Bridget, you're single, traveling, busy schedule. What does that look like? What, what does dating look like as a female preacher? Malo. Well, <laughs> well, it is difficult because for several reasons. Um, number one, you want to be careful about your name. Right. You want to be careful about your reputation, uh, where you go, who you're seen with. And so I'm a very private person just right. by nature. Um, but yet I'm open to whatever the Lord has. So I'm careful, Right. very careful where I'm going, how I'm you know, entertaining in hotel lobbies and yes. hotel rooms and right. all of that. Uh, being very careful, but yet being open uh, to what, the Lord has. Bridget, talk to me. Single and dating. I certainly can concur with Sister uh, Vandalin, but also just really want to even speak to the 
uh, point that uh, some people have the notion that in order for you to be successful in ministry, you do have to be married. Uh, you do have to be with a partner, but it is possible to remain single and yet still operate in um, ministry so that, again, while you are single, knowing who you are, wholeness, who you are, so when he does find you and you unite, uh, you, you are that good thing to him. So, again, it, it is a protocol, as Sister Vandalin mentioned, about being uh, single and in ministry. And one the main thing is, again, uh, keep keeping that, you know, private as the Lord is, is leading you until time for it to become Absolutely. in the public. How many single ladies we got in the room? Oh, just a few. How many of y'all feel like men are intimidated because you're a strong preacher? Talk to me. Uh, definitely. Our sister uh, talked about being a strong woman and having a certain label to that. Uh, I was raised, fortunate to be raised with three uh, older brothers, uh, my mom and my dad, and they had a great influence on me. And uh, I'm a strong woman. Absolutely. And I know that. Uh, and I do sometimes get that intimidation aspect uh, that uh, they're not sure if they can handle you. But if you can't uh, handle all of me, <laughs> and what you see, then you certainly wouldn't wouldn't be able to handle uh, behind the scenes. So, so we got don't be with scared. Unique, don't be scared. We got someone <laughs> with a unique case in that not only is she a woman single in ministry, but she's a superstar. Yeah. What does dating look like for you? Um, you just put me on the spot. I did. <laughs> Uh, I would say it's the same as my sister said. I'm very careful. I try to make sure um, my reputation is a clean kind of thing. Uh, and I don't spend too much time. Like, if I know it ain't it, I'm out of there. Like, okay. all right, thank you. We, that's it. God bless you. Um, and then I also, again, try to make sure a lot of us are saying it, and I think it's a beautiful thing, and it should be noted because a lot of people in the world think that there are some of us that are in the kingdom that are not trying to live like something so that it's matching what we're actually speaking. But there are some of us that actually are trying to be a living revival, a walking revival, and actually live like something. So I think if you really mean what you're speaking about, then your conviction will kind of eat at you wow. if you're not, you know, doing what you're supposed to do. But, I mean, I like a man. Don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but I do try to not spend too much time, be wise with my time. Like you said, not spending a lot of time. Being careful of my conversations, because the wrong conversation gets you in the right trouble, too. Absolutely. And I try to consider my unborn children. I don't want my daughter saying, well, mama, you did this. I heard about that, you know. So that I, I, I concur 100%. Okay, now let's just talk, not just the ladies, but I'm a single brother. Dating our single brothers. What does that look like with social media now? You go on one date and it's not turning into marriage. Now all of a sudden you're a playboy because you decided to post that y'all were at Cracker Barrel. What, what does dating for singles, period, look like? Are we intimidated to date? Talk to us. I don't think we should be intimidated to date, but I think you need to be careful about dating. Um, and so I think we have a tendency to make sure, we have, need to make sure we don't uh, date, just date around for dating's sake. And I think that's something a lot of people do. The last time I was in a relationship, I said, I'm not gonna jump from relationship to relationship. I'm gonna take my time before I go into another one. And I don't wanna be known as a playboy around the church or doing anything like that. And I think it's extremely important that you not only consider taking the time to heal from what you've been through, but you take the time to make sure you don't take your baggage to some other place. And you have to be, if that's the way you preach and teach to people about leaving their baggage at the altar and leaving their pots at, at the well, like the woman at the well, then you need to be able to live that same way. Um, and I think we need to practice that in our life and our ministries. Wow. Do y'all feel like the generation before us allows us to date? I would say yes. They do allow, allow us to date, and I'm old-fashioned in the regard that dating is for marriage. And as many have said, you have to be careful. I was in ministry single for about 15 years wow. when I met my husband, and it almost seemed to people that I popped up and got married, but it was not. We dated over a year and a half before we got married, but I was not, it was not in social media. It was Absolutely. not everywhere. I wasn't everywhere with it, so to speak, uh, because I had to guard my reputation. I had to guard my name, and as Sister Kiara said, if there was not the one, I had no issue with saying, okay, bro, 
you, we're going to keep it rolling <laughs> and go on with life because I had ministry, I had life, I had children, I'm a grandmother. And so it was a lot going on. And if he was not the one, I was not going to waste my time. But early on, I knew that he was, but I kept it guarded and those close to me knew. But then when I got married, everybody was like, wow, you got married. When wow. did that happen? Mm -hmm. So wow. it, it's allowed, but at the same time, we still have to remember that dating is for marriage. It's time to uh, investigate and get to know a person. Incredible. Y'all having a good time so far? Yeah. All right. Let's go straight to the Emerge Room. I'm C.I. Ben Johnson, and I am here in the ER, the Emergent Room, and we just finished an outstanding, intense, powerful discussion on women in ministry. My goodness. I mean, there were a plethora of topics that were discussed. I mean, from being right, right, single right. to uh, one of the things I want to ask you about, though, that really struck. I was like, my goodness, when LaShawn says specifically when she compared discrimination against women in ministry to racism. That, that was deep. Tell it me was, how you feel about was, that. It was very deep. And I, I believe in my heart that if we really want to look at things as they really are, you, we've got to tell the truth about, about what it is that we're dealing with. She said not only that, but we have to do it two times better. Two times better. Double better yeah, right. in order even to be accepted yeah. or right, to be right. looked at. But I saw something on Instagram the other um, last week that really, really blessed me. And, and the post said, the moment you begin to prove to try to prove yourself okay. is the moment you've lost or diminished your own value. Ooh. You must know your value. There's no need to run after someone else's thoughts or their opinion. Absolutely. And we face that a lot. Don't you agree, Major? We Absolutely. have faced that a lot yeah. where we're constantly trying to be or prove something to someone else. Right. When Absolutely. if I'm just who I am right. and understand the value that lies inside of me, yeah. then yeah. I can be the best that I can be and Absolutely. be a real blessing Absolutely. to someone else. Absolutely. I'm not struggling with insecurity. That's you know? true. Right. That's Absolutely. 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 Do you think that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, yeah. I was about to say a uh, very, very valid point, um, uh, Charlize. Uh, I think that we have to consider that God will never anoint who we pretend to be. That's right. He will only anoint who you are. Absolutely. And I think with that, uh, we have to speak to uh, authenticity. Who has God anointed you to be? Um, there were so many valid points, of course, that were brought up in the discussion. Yeah. Um, and I think if we embrace that, uh, we, we'll, we'll be able to see a really, really pour out, a, a strong pour out, excuse me, of power, of sure. course, on the, uh, on the female gender. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One thing I love that we talk about, once you embrace who you are, mm -hmm. I can celebrate somebody else because Absolutely. I'm not trying to be somebody else. Right. Right. I don't need to be right. the next right. so-and-so. Right. I can right. just be the best Demetra. Right. I can be, I don't have to preach like somebody. Absolutely. I don't need to try to get their anointing. So that means I don't need to necessarily hang out with them all the time sure. or try to hang on to their coattails because right. right. I don't need to connect with them connect with because I can just be who God has me to be right. because what God has called me to do, he hasn't called somebody else to do. The assignment that is on my life is on my life right. and no one can take it. It doesn't matter who I'm connected to. Sure. So if I just trust God and focus, mm -hmm. I can take my assignment, celebrate your assignment, right. celebrate right. Sean, Absolutely. your assignment, Absolutely. Cecil, your assignment, yes. Major, your assignment. Absolutely. And Ivan, I can celebrate your assignment. And I can celebrate you too. Because <laughs> I don't have to be intimidated by you all. Absolutely. Not at all. Listen, I do not have to sleep my way to the top. Wow. I don't have wow. to sleep my way to the top. Wow. Let, let, let's chime in on that. Where, where does that come from? What is that rooted in? I, I mean, where does that come from? I, you know, there, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes with that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's a lot that goes with that. Um, but I think, I think people's perception is their reality. Mm -hmm. And that's when we have to speak to those things. We have to, you, it, it doesn't sound nice, don't feel good, but you got to speak to it. Right. Because that's some people's perception. That's, sure. you know, that's how they really feel. See, so Vandalin talked about speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. And what can we do as men of God, all of us here are men of God, right. to help to not continue to foster patriarchal systems within the church? I think that we should support one another. We Absolutely. need more unity within the body of Christ, mm -hmm. specifically the men and women of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So support and anchor them. Don't repeat the cycles that Absolutely. were once presented by our forefathers, but break that cycle That's good. with prayer and support. That's good. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, listen, don't go anywhere. We're going to be back in just a few moments, but we've got a very special message just for you.
The 112th Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ will convene November 4th through 12th, 2019 in St. Louis, Missouri at the Dome in America Center. This year's Holy Convocation speakers include Superintendent John Smith, Tuesday morning, November 5th. Bishop Tyrone Butler, Tuesday evening. Bishop Paul Herman, Wednesday morning manna, November 6th. Evangelist Latera Tillman, Wednesday afternoon. Bishop Roger Jones, Wednesday evening. Bishop Mark Thomas, Thursday morning manna, November 7th. Bishop Designate Edwin Walker, Thursday afternoon. Bishop Vincent Matthews, Mission Service, Thursday. Bishop S.E. Eigelhart, Thursday evening. Assistant Supervisor Joyce Rogers, Friday morning manna, November 8th. Mother Barbara McCool Lewis, Women's Day Speaker. Pastor Michael Golden, Men's Day Speaker, Friday. Pastor John Hanna, Special Guest, Friday evening. Superintendent Micaiah Young, Saturday evening. Presiding Bishop Charles E. Blake Sr., the Lord's Day Service, Sunday morning, November 10th. Bishop Michael Cole, Sunday evening. Don't miss this year's Holy Convocation, November 4th through 12th in St. Louis, Missouri. Come experience miracles, signs, and wonders. It's getting ready to happen. Register today at www.kojic.org. Author Gary Sprewell pins an exciting new book, The Upgrade, How to Turn Water into Wine, forwarded by Bishop Marvin Sapp. This exciting new book gives practical principles from a divine encounter and shows you how to live life on the next level. Buy this book to help you apply principles for a successful life, business, and family. Hear what people are saying about this new book. Every page will bring you closer to first-class faith and further away from a coach-class mentality. Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. His new book, The Upgrade, gives profound yet practical principles that will escalate the reader to another level of living. Bishop Noel Jones. Go purchase The Upgrade at GarySprewell.com or Amazon.com. The Bible speaks of lineage and legacy all throughout the script, all throughout the Old and New Testament. And for many years as a child, I was a little bit envious because I always wanted a father or mother that was in ministry, that would leave an inheritance in terms of ministry to me. Uh, most people know that my mom was Greg and my daddy was a Rolling Stone, as I like to put it. Um, and so I always admired and a little bit envied individuals whose fathers and mothers were uh, pastors and bishops, PKs, I think they called them. Um, but I never considered the struggle that they had while I'm uh, setting my own course and creating a legacy and lineage for those that will follow me. I never considered the struggle one must have trying to fill someone's shoes while still taking their own path. And so I want to talk to some individuals who have major names in ministry and are doing major things in their own right. And I want to see what it exactly that looks like for them. Well, we're back. Well, we're back and I'm extremely, are y'all having a good time? Yeah. All right. Well, as you saw from the introduction, we've got some of the children of some of the biggest and most iconic names in ministry. On this panel, we've got Clarence Sellers and Benita Sellers Austin. Now, your grandfather was Bishop, the late Bishop Samuel L. Green, who was a trailblazer. He was, in fact, the first black Christian. He was the first owner of the black Christian network in the country. He sat on the board of the NBRB. He has contemporaries of like Oral Roberts, Pat Robinson. Your mother was a thriving prophetic voice. Your father is an apostle in the Lord's church. On this same panel, we've got Paul Gatlin, whose grandfather was a living, is a living legend, the Bishop Roy L. H. Winbush, who was literally the mastermind behind Kojic Publishing Board. He was an innovator, and he was actually the person that organized what we now call AIM, and the list goes on and on and on with him. His father is a jurisdictional prelate, uh, one of the longest 
uh, lasting department heads for the Church of God in Christ, mothers, a preaching machine, supervisor, songwriter. Brian Nelson comes from two great legends. Your father was once called the Prince of Preachers in the Church of God in Christ. Your mother is a legendary singer, the Betty Ransom Nelson. And then, I don't even, you really don't even need to introduce Kiara and Jay Drew, who have legends on both sides of your family. I mean, the Clark sisters on one side, your daddy, your granddaddy on the other. Your father is one of the most respected uh, generals of our church now. Your grandfather, general board, uh, uh, chairman of the board of bishops. Pressure or no? Talk to me, Kiara. What does that make you? Just listening to that. Talk to us about that. Uh, it, it's pressure. It's a good pressure, though. Um, I guess I'm, I have to be careful, too, because all of that, all of those... Um, accolades and titles and all of that now I'm nervous to even answer your question <laughs> um, it's special though uh, I, I want to say they definitely have set a standard that now I want to set for my niece my nephew my my, my children whoever it is that's coming behind us and um, I love it because I've seen them all in their household wow. and it's not just a name thing for them it's really how they live they really aim to live a clean life sometimes I'm like can I get a little bit more out of you this conversation <laughs> and it's like no this is black or white this is it and um, I will say it's quite inspiring and it, it, it makes me nervous so I'm gonna stop there Wow uh, sister Benita <laughs> Your mother, like I said, was one of the most accurate female prophets I've ever seen in my life. And now she's gone on to be with the Lord. I heard someone say that when your parent dies and you inherit that ministry or that mantle, you inherit all of their, some of their friends and all of their enemies. How do you find your own footing while trying to ease away from the pressure of that family legacy? Well, for me, I had to become comfortable in who I am understand the call of God on my life and walk that out. I cannot walk in anybody else's shoes. I do receive the mantle. I do understand that there's a prophetic gift upon me as it was my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother. I understand that I do have the um, many other gifts in spiritual gifts and natural gifts that they have, but I had to learn my place in it and walk it out as Benita is supposed to walk it out according to God because my mother taught me to have a relationship with God. And so with me having a relationship with God, he's instructed me on what my call is, even though it may resemble what they are or who they are or what they've done. Wow. Um, Paul Gatlin, Brian Nelson, your families, they, they, they laid a foundation for the both of y'all. Do y'all feel the pressure to live up to that or, or are you just comfortable being you? Either one of y'all. Um, I agree definitely with what um, Sister Kiera said. Hold um, it up. I definitely agree with what Sister Kiera said. You do feel the pressure. Um, but what I've learned is how to embrace the legacy and also relieve the pressure. And the way to relieve the pressure is getting clarity from heaven. And once you have clarity from God, you're able to fulfill your assignment. Wow. Brian, legacy, pressure. Is it a burden it's, or a blessing? It's, it's, it's pressure, but it's a privilege as well. Um, because I, I listened in one of the other panels, and of course there's always a disparity between those who did not come through or what we call organizational lineage, and it can be a challenge for them to get through. And so I was blessed. I was privileged. My father, uh, at eight years old, taught me how to put a sermon together, taught me how to Good handle. job, too, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so I'm grateful because one of the blessings and the benefits is many people, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I had an opportunity to preach in Bailey Cathedral. Well, while preaching there, I hear all of these stories about years ago when my father stood in the same pulpit and wow. preached in the same room. So it's nostalgia for me uh, because I'm able to walk through doors that my father kicked open. Wow. Now, you know, Brian Nelson, my daddy, legendary preacher, mama, golden voice, and I think he got the best of both packages. My mama was a crackhead. Papa was a Rolling Stone. Y'all know my story. I don't have no pressure. And I was always envious of people like the Green family until I met them. Because then I realized how much Bishop Green accomplished. And I'm like, y'all got to live up to this? Sellers, tell me about that. Do you feel the pressure to keep up with your grandfather, your father and mother? Well, people will always put the expectation for you to fill the shoes of your parents and your grandparents. My grandfather was a tremendous trailblazer. Absolutely. Um, and then he was one of a kind. Absolutely. And so as you stated earlier, you gained the friends and you gained the enemies. 
people will make you feel like feel ashamed for being privileged. So I do count it as a privilege to be a part of the family that I am a part of. But the pressure is the expectation to live out our lives identical to what our forefathers have lived their lives. And I, I realized early on in ministry that if God wanted me to be Moses, he would have made me Moses. Wow. God wanted something in Joshua. There was something in Joshua that was needed. The Bible says this, that Samuel served his generation well. And so it's my responsibility not to try to relive their generation, but to be relevant for my generation, but with the same principles, foundation, and anointing that I have inherited. Incredible. Now, J. Drew, you know it's coming. Daddy's a preacher, granddaddy's a preacher, mama's a preacher, sister's a preacher. What do you say to the people who say you're not continuing their legacy because your ministry don't look like theirs? Well, it's important that we understand our calling. That's number one. You know, um, I think when you build a spiritual lifestyle and you have a relationship with God, you build a level of confidence to being able to see. I think God gave me uh, um, a vision, so I walk in it. So. Um, that's when I kind of get a little competitive about what I see right. because I know it was given to me by God. So I just kind of walk in it and I don't really kind of hear what people have to say. And um, just to kind of comment a little bit on the pressure thing, I don't feel pressure no matter what TV portrayed. Right. Talk to me, God. All that was, I never felt pressure because my, uh, we, the, the male figures I have in my, my life is they lead by example. Right. That my, 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 my father and my grandfather might not, they're open to it. They might not teach me exactly how to do one thing, but they're going to say, look, this is how I did it. You got the opportunity to do it, so it's up to you to put in the work and do what you have to do to succeed in that. So you telling me Bishop J. Drew Shear never said, either start preaching or I'm going to cut you off. He's definitely said that. He's definitely said <laughs> that. He definitely said that, but he, he throws it out there. You know, he don't he don't really be on my head too much. He wants me to walk. He wants it to be natural, you know, but um, I totally understand, like, what he mean by that. Though. Absolutely. How many of y'all feel pressured by your parents that are in ministry? Anybody got parents that are in ministry? Oh, my God. First of all, how about Rance Allen's daughter? And you're a singer, preacher. Do you feel that pressure? Absolutely. But let me tell you this. Rosh Hashanah just passed. Right. And I had to do some research about the shofar. Okay. And what I found out is the shofar is a ram's horn that has been cleaned out, polished to make a sound. And so we have to understand that we've been cleaned out and polished to make the sound that God has given us. Right. And not because of what somebody else is, is portraying. One of, the things that I, one of the things that I also have to understand is daddy says this. He says... When you go out of this house, you're not just representing yourself, but you're representing me too. Wow. So whatever you do on the street, don't let me go out in the field and find out my daughter sleeping with people, lying on people, uh, uh, using people for what they have. But I need to be on the road and come home and say, well, my daughter was doing this and doing that. And it was exemplifying the kingdom of God and not gratifying myself. Wow. Well, let's, let's, let's flip the script a little bit because... First natural, then spiritual. Y'all were privileged to have natural parents. Again, my mom and daddy weren't in ministry. But there's this whole conversation that's been going on about spiritual fathers. Spiritual. I'm so sick of it. I meet people with five, six, seven spiritual. How many spiritual daddies can you have? Let's talk to some people. Um, how, how many, first of all, how many spiritual daddies can you have at one time? Okay. All right. Talk to me about being pastored. Talk to me about that being mentored, having a real spiritual father? I would say, um, and I do thank God for my spiritual father and Uncle Bishop William McMillan. All right, Baltimore shameless America. plug. <laughs> but I will say the blessing is, is by not having a father or mother that are preachers, with an uncle who is the Lord is blessing and elevating in the church ever the more, it makes you pay attention and focus that you really got to be on your stuff. In the, in the aspect of the Lord has blessed me through the permission of my pastor, that's another thing. You want to make sure that you're in line with the person that covers you. Wow. And so being blessed to go out and preach and share and all those things, I make sure that the pastors I preach for call back home and give my bishop a report of what wow. I've done. Because I want to make sure that it's not a Tobias thing. And I was a very wait a big, minute, wait a minute, uh, wait, wait. What do you say to the ones that you just old school, dog? Ain't nobody finna do that. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Well, well, it could be considered old school, but it's right. 
if wow. that makes sense. And I'll say this. Many people will push Tobias. You should do something as a Tobias McCain Ministries. And my big thing was, I can't do that if my father's stuff isn't set up. Wow. And so I push him. And I believe as I do that, God opens doors and makes room. So what happens when you're dealing with a Saul and not a Samuel? Come on. Y'all playing too cool over here. What happens when you're dealing with a Saul and not a Samuel? When you're dealing with a Saul, it's very important to not fight Saul. Wow. Because when you fight Saul, you lose your purpose. And that's what David had to realize as he ran. It was not his job to even be scared of Saul. It was his job to walk in what God had called. One of the things that we miss is that even though a lot of people want 1,500 spiritual daddies, they never look like a son. Wow. A, a son has to be able to mirror what taught him. And so when I have a leader, my bishop, I call him my pastor. Right. Because some people want bishops to be organizational leaders. Bishop J. Drew Sheard is my pastor. Absolutely. So I submit to him, and I should be able to produce son fruit so my father can see what he's doing for me. Wow. 30 seconds. I could say that um, since I've been under the leadership of Bishop Pierce, that my ministry has gone, grown leaps and bounds. So it does matter um, who you're under. But I also wanted to comment to what um, Prophetess Benita was saying about walking it out as Benita, but still at times um, being seen as maybe her mother, because some of her characteristics of her mother might come out. And so when you have a mantle on your life, it's not something you have to um, push or, prime or try to be, but if it's on you, it's on you. And it reminds me of the story of Elisha and Elijah when um, Elisha asked for a double portion and Elijah responded and said back, thou asked a hard thing because... Wow. It wasn't given by Elijah. It was God given. Wow. And so um, we have to remember that when we walk out as our um, forefathers and our mentors and the people who have gone before us, that it's not what they can give us. It's what God has done. Wow. Algernon Cooper, Thriving Ministry in L.A., to submit or not to submit. Do you have a pastor? I'm putting you on the spot. Do you have a pastor? Yes, sir, I do. And I'm submitted to my pastor. I contact my pastor. I, you know, I don't just run wild. I'm not just, you know, out there doing my own thing, but I'm submitted to my pastor. Um, you know, anytime an opportunity is presented, uh, I present that to my pastor, and it's not a, hey, I'm going here. It's, you know, can I, should I, is it right for me to go here? Because, you know, that's the watchman for my soul. So the, my pastor may be privy to something that I'm not, you know, I'm not, aware of or I'm not conscious of because I'm just wanting to go and do it. But what if your pastor is just too demanding? I mean, he just wants too much. Ain't nobody got time to be calling you every day telling you where I'm at. Well, I, I know we're all adults, we're all grown, but there's a word that has a negative connotation now, and that's accountability. You have to be accountable. And if you're not in the proper position, the oil does not flow. So the oil flows from Aaron's beard. Wow. And so if you're not lined up, you may be a renegade, you may be gifted and talented, but there's no oil there. But well, what so do you do if you just can't afford to be that close? Because daddies want seeds. There's reports. Everybody wants, uh, you got to pay this for me to be your mentor. What do you do in that situation? I can't afford to be your son. <laughs> you got to serve, keep serving, and do, do the best thing you could do as far as serving. Giving yourself, uh, allowing your talents, and uh, putting forth yourself. Pushing your fathers even when, you know, you ain't got the money. Every time we don't have the money to do everything. But the Bible says your gifts and your callings will make room for you. So you got to put forth that effort to serve even when you don't want to. But what, do you, what happens when you preach better than your daddy or your mama? Well, I don't have that testimony. <laughs> <laughs> you bet not on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make that very clear. To. I don't have that testimony. But you know, we, there's also a word called process okay. that we've got to remember. So this accountability, this, this submission, even dealing with Saul, there's a process. The process was not just to expose da Saul, but to get some things out of David too. Wow. So while we are waiting, even though we're dealing with jealousy or whatever we're dealing with, we have to uh, bring ourselves under subjection to the spirit of God and that man or woman may be the person that is being used to get those things Paul, out of I us. I think I heard you say you're supposed to preach better than your pastor. Absolutely. Um, you're supposed to learn and, and build on everything that they have but yet take it to another level which is why you're a son, which is why you receive the mantle because it's supposed to go higher with you. So has Bishop J. Drew Sheard ever told you Kiara, now look, you preach but you, listen this is my church. Don't nobody preach this good but me. You never had that issue? 
No, uh, my father is very supportive of me. He's always even telling me to read a little bit more than what he may have done, if that makes sense. So Absolutely. he's always encouraging me to go. He, I think the, the thing that I love about my father is that whatever I do that as well, it's a representation of him. So it's like, well, I'm winning if you win it. Absolutely. Um, so I love that, and it's very inspiring, and it, it encourages me to dig deeper, to have something better or deeper to say, because he, he studies, and I love it. So it challenges me. We're going to the ER, but before we go, I got one more question, and I think the ER is about to light up. Clarence Sellers, Jr., daddies come with organizations, they come with fellowships, they come with denominations. Are these things even relevant anymore? That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, denominations will never go away. You will always have denominations, but I think the more important thing is to understand that the Lord's church is one, one Lord, one faith one baptism. The challenge to come with denominations is that oftentimes we hold our traditions above the word of God. And wow. then we end up isolating people wow. when God's church is universal. And so wow. when you make your church the only church or God's church, then you're really outside of scripture because all of us are the body of Christ. It is not the Baptist section of heaven, church guy in Christ section of heaven, PAW section of heaven. We are all the kingdom of God. We are all one. In John 17, Jesus said this, Lord, make them one as you and I are one. And so the last thing on that is Paul said in the book of Ephesians, he says, until we all come into the unity of the faith, into the full stature of Christ. And so I think that you're seeing now in this generation, the first of a generation that is saying, hey, I'm not as loyal supposedly to a denomination as it is. I'm ready to become like Christ. Wow. 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 Let's see what the ER got to say. Ivan Johnson back here in the ER. My goodness, now that really got pretty extensive. It really did. That became it really, really did. extensive. Listen, expectation without instruction. Major, hold so, in on that. Uh, there was so much, of course, that was said in the last set. It was phenomenal. Um, but I cued in on what uh, Brian stated uh, regarding uh, being led by, of course, example. The question becomes, how do I do what you've done and you haven't shown me how to do it? Right. I think uh, if, if, if we're really going to look at the reality of what we're dealing with, uh, several people right now who are part, of course, of the David generation, being, uh, uh, we've got we've to deal with the reality that power without instruction as well as implementation that becomes legal. Very dangerous. It becomes legal. Yeah. It becomes yeah. dangerous. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Very dangerous. Yeah, I agree with that holistically because um, if you don't wean me in the process, you've already messed That's up. True. I That's think it. we've got to go through that process. Uh, Sister Vandalin touched on that yes. tonight. Yes. And yes. as leaders, it works both ways. Yes. Right. You know, we hold the younger generation to that standard, but we've got to lift up that standard among the forefathers Absolutely. that they have to instruct us and right. tell us, show us that they went through that process as well. Absolutely with the Saul versus David right. characters. And I yeah, think yeah. when you go through that process, mm -hmm. it'll work out. It'll work so out. we'll know the difference between a Saul and a Solomon. That's That's right. you have. And That's then true. it becomes a strong form of suppression as well. Mm -hmm. So we throw these people out in the water. Yeah. Like for me, I don't come from a lineage of pastors. We throw them out on the water and say, it's tough love, let them learn. Mm -hmm. And we're suppressing them exactly. from absolutely mm -hmm. progressing exactly. and right. learning and, and being integral leaders. Yeah. yeah. Right. And one thing I like um, that J. Drew said is, if it's not natural, don't push it. Don't push yeah. it. If you're not a preacher, you're just not a preacher. You don't have to preach because your dad preaches. You don't have to sing because your mom sings. If it's not natural, don't push it. Because to preach the word of God is a call from God. It's not just about inheritance. It's not just about getting it because your daddy is a preacher, because your daddy can't get you into heaven. Your mom can't get you into heaven. It's got to be a divine call from God. It does. It really does. I, I agree with what Sean was saying. God chooses our parents. That's true. I'm, I am just as validated whether my dad is a bishop yes. Come on. That's or right. my grandmother's a crackhead. Right. I'm, yep. I'm just Absolutely. being honest that right. God has chosen them, for, has chosen them to be your parents for a reason. They speak to mm -hmm. who we are and sure. what our testimony is, mm -hmm. what our past is, is as important as our future is right. and our current present. Absolutely. And I don't think it's anything that f for us to be ashamed of. I, I think it was um, Clarence Sellers that said it. He said, I don't feel, you know, I don't feel guilty. 
Right. For being who I am. Right. I was born yeah. to these gr- it's, it's, it's a privilege. That was Brian that Brian. said that. And Brian. I appreciated I appreciated Brian for being honest yes. Yes. as a PK for yes. saying it is pressure, yes. but it's also yes. a, privilege a privilege to acknowledge mm-hmm. that PKs do get certain privileges. Right. Yeah. He said that he kicked the door down for him. He did. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They get advantages. Well, listen, we've got to go, but we've had a wonderful time with you here today. We are here in the ER. And we've got some important information just for you. Yeah. Do not change the channel. Stay right here. The 112th Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ will convene November 4th through 12th, 2019 in St. Louis, Missouri at the Dome in America Center. This year's Holy Convocation speakers include Superintendent John Smith, Tuesday morning, November 5th. Bishop Tyrone Butler, Tuesday evening. Bishop Paul Harmon, Wednesday morning manna, November 6th. Evangelist LaTara Tillman, Wednesday afternoon. Bishop Roger Jones, Wednesday evening. Bishop Mark Thomas, Thursday morning manna, November 7th. Bishop Designate Edwin Walker, Thursday afternoon. Bishop Vincent Matthews, Mission Service, Thursday. Bishop S.E. Igelhart, Thursday evening. Assistant Supervisor Joyce Rogers, Friday morning manna, November 8th. Mother Barbara McCool Lewis, Women's Day Speaker. Pastor Michael Golden, Men's Day Speaker, Friday. Pastor John Hanna, special guest, Friday evening. Superintendent Micaiah Young, Saturday evening. Presiding Bishop Charles E. Blake Sr., the Lord's Day Service, Sunday morning, November 10th. Bishop Michael Cole, Sunday evening. Don't miss this year's Holy Convocation, November 4th through 12th in St. Louis, Missouri. Come experience miracles, signs, and wonders. It's getting ready to happen. Register today at www.kojic.org. Author Gary Sprewell pins an exciting new book, The Upgrade, How to Turn Water into Wine, forwarded by Bishop Marvin Sapp. This exciting new book gives practical principles from a divine encounter and shows you how to live life on the next level. Buy this book to help you apply principles for a successful life, business, and family. Hear what people are saying about this new book. Every page will bring you closer to first-class faith and further away from a coach-class mentality. Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. His new book, The Upgrade, gives profound yet practical principles that will escalate the reader to another level of living. Bishop Noel Jones. Go purchase The Upgrade at GarySpreewell.com or Amazon.com. Are you having a good time tonight? Listen, first of all, let's shout out the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, the Honorable Bishop Charles Edward Blake, Sr. So extremely excited. If you're anywhere near the St. Louis area, meet us in November for the Holy Convocation. I promise you it's going to be life-changing. And then on your way to St. Louis, pick up my book, Shameless Plug. You can follow me. I told him to clap. You can follow me at GarySpiro.com. You can pick it up. I guarantee you there's something in this book that's going to help you get to the next level. Let's go back to the Shelby Five. Joy in the morning. hands everybody come on listen now troubles let them fade away hey brush it off like it was yesterday hey when you're feeling like you're getting low oh. then you switch up your scenario oh. everybody's gotta feel the rain hey when the storm is giving you the pain hey you just tell yourself to let it go oh. keep it shining like you're winning
As you probably seen around the country, there's this emergence of new spiritual gifts. I mean, everyone's a prophet, everyone's a prophetess now. Uh, but what I've learned, because I've been preaching since I was a child, what I've learned very early on is that gifts are free, but the process is very expensive. And what I found out is that a lot of people want the platform, but nobody really wants the process. Of course, people know my testimony. I started at six when I preached my first message. I uh, started preaching seriously at about 15. Um, I was a little bit of a renegade, uh, didn't really like to be corrected and told what to do. And as a result, I kind of delayed my success because I refused to go through the process. And that's what really what Gifted is all about. Gifted is about identifying the gift as recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and it's the nine gifts, the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing and so forth. But what I've learned is, like me, a lot of people want the platform, but not necessarily the process. Gifted is about taking emerging gifts and training them, mentoring them, sharpening them. For it is iron that sharpens iron. I think it's been an incredible night so far. What y'all think? It's been pretty incredible. Um, Gifted is an initiative that we started through the Church of God in Christ, through the Department of Evangelism. Shout out to Bishop Elijah Hankerson, Dr. Dorinda Clark Coar, President and Elect Lady. But that program was designed to train, mentor, and equip emerging gifts. And what we find is, and I, I dealt with it when we launched Gifted in the International AIM Convention, we talked about how there's this surgence of authentic gifts, but just like anything else, whenever you have a, a surgence of something authentic, there's always an, a counterfeit that comes with it. And I think that we have a challenge in our generation where we have to be able to identify the real gifts from the counterfeit and learn how to invest in the real genuine gifts and sharpen them so that they'll be better. So I want to have a conversation about what gifted is. What does it look like? Um, Evangelist C. Whitelaw, you have been in ministry and have been at the top of your game for some time now, and I know you've seen a lot. What does it mean to be gifted? To be gifted is to have a... A, uh, a, a gift on the inside. It had something that God put into you uh, to be a help in the body of Christ through God's calling, God's anointing, and God's word. And when you're gifted, that means what he put in you has to be cultivated to be a help to people that are in need in the world. Because to be gifted, you have to be careful how you operate in the gifting. Because you're gifted doesn't mean that you are wayward to do whatever you want to wow. do. It has to be under authority. Wow. And what's happening, we're seeing people that are gifted. They have uh, prophecy in them. They have uh, interpretation of dreams. They have uh, the anointing of God to, to uh, preach. Those particular gifts, but people a lot of times don't want to be under somebody's authority to say, hey, before you move forward, you got to stand still and be taught. Wow. how to use what's on the inside of you that you're not going here and there because you have a gift on the inside of you. Wow. Marcus Mickles, how do you identify a genuine gift from a counterfeit? We got a lot of Facebook prophets out there now. H well, how do you tell the difference? Well, you know, the, the Bible talks about that we have the Holy Ghost that gives us power and accessible through the Holy Ghost is the, the gift of discernment. And we have to be able to properly know uh, if that person is here from God. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy 18, 22 talks about a prophet that speaks presumptuously. If they say something and it does not come to pass, you ought to disregard them and that prophecy. Uh, and, and it comes to uh, pastors allowing gifts to come forward, training individuals, and if they don't have the ability to train, to bring in individuals to assist them in training, um, as well as pastors teaching their members to be submitted, you can't, you shouldn't be listening to a Facebook prophet that's on 24 hours a day, I'm sure wow. somebody's on right now, uh, <laughs> prophesying and have a cash app, but you won't sow into your own ministry. Uh, many times these folks do investigation on who you are, uh, they're accessible. They have a team that's looking up on Google Earth where you stay. And these word of knowledge gifts are false. They're fake. They've done preliminary research on you. Uh, and I think we ought to know by way of the Holy Ghost if something is real. It ought to bear witness in our spirit. Uh, I digress. Wow. 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 Now, let's, let's be very clear. 
because this panel is full of prophetic voices, and we're not saying that all word of knowledge is false. Absolutely not. But how important, because what I hear you saying is if, it is, if it's of God, it'll come to pass. So um, evangelist um, Tillman, can a real prophet miss? Well, the Bible says that we know in part. Okay. We prophesy in part. And when you start looking at um, the human side of us, uh, when you really begin to look at the surface of who we are, there are times that you can miss. Wow. Is it profitable okay. to do that? No, it's not. And I believe that it comes through immature people that have not been properly trained, who have not been disciplined, and who have not laid before the Lord, honestly. Because when you really have real relationship with the Lord, God will download to you accurate wow. word. And that word that is spoken in the life of individuals, you can guarantee it will come to pass. Wow. How important, uh, um, Pastor Nate, people, I, I get millions, well, not millions, I get hundreds of people every year, whether it be through Facebook, email, or throughout the conventions as I travel, who ask me, how do I get my gift sharpened like you? How, how do I get to hear like you or do what you do? And my go-to response is, the more time you spend with God, the more you know his voice. How important is a prayer life? People want to talk for God, but don't talk to him. There, there is no way you can be a pastor, evangelist, prophet, prophetess, unless you have a relationship with the Lord. Um, what people fail to realize, we are the fruit of our founder, um, the late Bishop C.H. Mason. He was a prayer warrior. He was a man of prophecy. Um, in order for you to sharpen your gift, you must spend time with God. Um, you must be in a place of worship, a place of hearing him. Um, if we look in the word of God, when Samuel was in the house, House of Eli. The Bible says that when Samuel would come at the night and say to Eli, have you called me? He would say, no, go back again. He was training him to hear the ear that his ear would hear the voice of God. And I think that when we are in prayer, it allows us to know the voice of God and know what it is that God is calling us to do. Wow. It's incredible that the voice that he heard sounds like his pastor. So it sounds like we're going back to fathers. We're going back to mentors. We're going back to a covering. How important is it? Is, is it to be gifted, but to be covered. Because there's a lot of guys who are running revivals every day of the week. They don't tie it to nobody. They don't submit to nobody. They telling you to do stuff they won't do. How important is that, uh, Shondell? It is very important that you have, it is, it is very important that you have a spiritual covering. You have to submit to leadership. Number one, he was talking about living righteous, hearing the voice of God. But in your covering and submitting to leadership, you're not out there on your own. Wow. I believe in the pastoral covering. We're not wonderful. Right. We are servants to God's people in the kingdom. Just because we have the gift, just because we have the anointing, we still have to submit to authority. So Pastor Michael Green, as a pastor and a prophetic voice, a gifted individual, Give me two or three nuggets that you would give someone who is gifted but need direction. Um, I think one of the things you must do, you have to submit. You have to submit. And I think a lot of us who are now coming up, uh, we want to have the power and the effect of ministry without the submission. You need to submit. That brings about accountability. And that makes you then responsible. And so if you don't submit, you don't really be, you're not able to tap into the flow uh, that brings you into a place of accountability where now you are responsible for what you're distributing to the masses. Can I just submit one more thing? And I think it's very important to say we need to understand that there is a difference between the anointing and the gift. Okay. Talk to me. Uh, uh, the, the, the anointing flows based upon a position, but the gift is something you're born with. Right. It, it's something that has to be stirred up. Paul said to Timothy, you, you received this gift by the laying on of hands. And really what he was suggesting is that somebody that you're submitted to, that you are under, stirred that thing up inside. Wow you and help you to understand that you got it. You got to be careful because there's some people who operate in the spirit of witchcraft wow. and divination who know how to stir stuff up in you too. Wow. So you start operating in the gifts you have but through a soulish realm. 
and that's when it becomes dark and evil and corrupt. Wow. And that's when your motives begin to shift to, I need you to, I can prophesy for a dollar. Wow. But people who have the authentic anointing of God, who have been stirred up by fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God, they're then able to serve without notoriety. They're able to serve without financial gain. Yeah. That stuff is added to you as you grow. God doesn't give that to you initially. It happens as you develop along the way. Because if God gave you too much too soon, your immaturity would consume it. 30 seconds. Sharon um, C. Whitelaw, you got YouTube clips in 9 and 10 million views, but you still go home and serve with your husband. How important is that? It is very important to serve because we are servants. Wow. I go home and I am the choir advisor. I'm over the choir. I make sure the music in our church. With nine million views on YouTube? Nine million, million views on YouTube. Wow. I am the choir advisor. I help our church mother with the women's department. I make sure that the vision that the, my husband, the pastor, has for our church is still operating in the areas that I serve in. And one of the things that we must realize is that we must realize that no matter what gift is in us, no matter what God has called us to, remain in a low place. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you become consumed of yourself, Thank you. then you have lost your connection with God. Wow. 10 million views on YouTube don't make me who I am. It's serving God, submitted to God, because the anointing is not mine. It's God's anointing. And what's happening in the body of Christ, people are consumed with who they are in the face of people. Wow. The same people that said that Jesus is Jesus, the same people said crucify, crucify him. So I'm not consumed with what people say about me. I live to know what God wants to know and what God is pleased about my life. And so I live to please him. So I'm not consumed with what's going on on YouTube, what's going on, on Facebook, who says I'm this and that. No, I want God to say servant. Well done. You have served me well. And so that's what we're losing in the body of Christ. People want to be wonderful, but they don't want to serve. Wow. They want to be served. Wow. 15 to 30 seconds because our time is winding up. I think we need to do this again. What y'all think? Oh, yes. What do you hear God saying to this generation? 15 to 30 seconds apiece. We'll go this way and then we'll end with Pastor Mickles. God is doing in this hour is that he's shifting the generation that we're living in. I believe that he is enlightening us and opening us to a greater way and a greater knowledge. In this hour, I believe that gifts are going to manifest. And upon those gifts being manifested, you're going to begin to see leaders that are going to be coming out of the dust. They're going to be coming out from behind the mountain. People are going to be seen that you've never seen before because God's hand is on their life. There is a greater grace that's being released in this hour. And I believe that God is getting ready to use some of these people that you've never seen before. Shondell, 30 seconds. In this hour... I hear God saying the gifts, the miracles, the signs and the wonders back when Bishop C.H. Mason was poured into the church of God in Christ. You are now in a generation where you will see unspoken prophets and prophets that are living righteous yeah. and holy because righteousness exalts a nation. Come on. Sin is a reproach, but righteousness exalts a nation. So we're getting ready to see a Pentecostal, the jubilistic move in this hour. And so we have to be ready for this season because God is sending the prophets to speak to the body of Christ. Michael Green. Quite simply, I believe God is speaking to this, this age and this generation. He's giving identity. Wow. This is an hour where God is identifying new voices. He's raising up new people. I agree with Prophetess Tillman that this is an hour that God is speaking to the dust. He's formating something new and he's breathing into it. But we've got to be careful how we handle it. Yeah. Because if we don't handle it right, we will manipulate it and we will corrupt it and cause it to be lost until the next generation.
Nate Jefferson. I believe that this is an hour where the wind of God and the breath of God is breathing upon our church. Um, as Prophet has said earlier, as it relates to individuals that we have never seen, the Bible says that in the book of Kings that Obadiah hid the prophets in the cave. I believe that this is an emerging of individuals that are coming to the forefront. I believe that God is bringing us to the forefront, those individuals that will lift up holy hands and out of their bellies cry yes to the Lord. That will cry hallelujah those that will cry holy unto the lord there is a calling and emerging that god is bringing us back to the foundations of our faith marcus mickles those that have paid the price in prayer in consecration in integrity before the lights camera and the action god say that there are hidden stars that i reveal and release now god is releasing an apostolic prophetic anointing even on our church again people that are no names that are not connected to inheritance and lineages that have names of notoriety they shall come to the forefront we will see the god of the bible in full operation miracles healings signs wonders breakthroughs instantaneous deliverance god's getting ready to use this church in its first glory again well this has been project emerge live from detroit michigan I am extremely excited because this is just the start of something great. You can follow me on all social media outlets at Gary Sprewell. Visit us at GarySpreewell.com. Once again, Word Network, Kevin Adele, thank you all so much for this opportunity. If you need prayer, you want to sow a seed because this is good ground, you know the number to call, 855-730-WORD. There's someone waiting to take your prayer request, request and put that seed in the ground for you. I'm extremely excited because God is up to something, and what you've witnessed is some of the greatest voices in the Church of God in Christ. Our general supervisor, we're here to love you. We want you to know that we're thinking and praying for you. So this short tribute is to show you how much we care.